Hi, I'm Liv and welcome to the Book Nook. My hair is really rather bouffant today. I've got a bit Michael McIntyre now, haven't it? Mmm, mandrel, mmm, mandrel. <laughs> this is the third part of my May haul and I've got quite a few so I'm just gonna get on with things. First up, I got myself a graphic novel. I got volume one of Deadly Class. This is a graphic novel series that I've seen Amy over at Shout Amy talking about for a while now, and I've been like, ooh, intrigued. So I picked myself up the first volume of this one. Change the world with a bullet. It's 1987 and homeless teenager Marcus Lopez Aguelo has no reason to keep living until one fateful evening he is approached by a mysterious girl who invites him to join King's Dominion Atelier of the Deadly Arts, a brutal clandestine high school where the world's top crime families send the next generation of assassins to be trained. Murder is an art, killing is a craft, and the dagger in your back is no metaphor. So this one is done by Rick Remender, Wes Craig and Lee Luffridge um, to experience the 1980s underground through the eyes of the most damaged and dangerous teenagers on earth. So volume one is 1987 Reagan Youth. So this looks really, really good. I like my graphic novels a little bit dark and twisty. So um, this one looks like it'll be perfect for that. Then I picked up myself three poetry collections. So the first one is one that I've been meaning to pick up for a little while now, and that is Alice Oswald's Falling Awake. Um, I really like Alice Oswald's stuff. Um, Dart is a really, really good one, especially because it's based in Devon, so, you know, biased. So the blurb for this one, as blurbs for poetry collections go, Alice Oswald's poems are always vivid and distinct, alert, and deeply physically engaged in the natural world. Mutability, a sense that all matter is unstable in the force of mortality, is at the heart of this new collection, and each poem is involved in that drama, the held tension that is embodied in life, and life's losing struggle with the gravity of nature. Working as before with an ear to the oral tradition, these poems attend to the organic shapes and sounds and momentum of language as it's spoken, as well as how it's thought. Fresh, fluid and propulsive, but also fragmentary, repetitive, these are poems that are written to be read aloud. Orpheus and Tythonus appear at the beginning and the end of this book, alive in an English landscape, stuck in the clockwork of their old speech, and the hours, goddesses of the seasons and the natural apportioning of time, are the presiding figures. The persistent conditions are flux and falling, and the lines are in constant motion, approaching from daring new angles our experience of being human, coalescing into poems of simple, stunning beauty. So I have been meaning to read this one for a while, ever since it won the Costa Book Awards uh, in the poetry category, so I'm really excited to spend some time with this one, and that one is by Cape Poetry. Then I picked up a copy of David Harson's A Bird's Idea of Flight by Faber and Faber Poetry, and this one, I read his collection Fire Songs quite a while ago now, and I think that one's really fantastic. So this one says, A Bird's Idea of Flight describes a circular journey. Twelve poems chart the outward journey, the thirteenth is pivotal, and twelve poems bring the traveller back. The subject of his quest is thanatology. In particular, he is deeply curious about the business of his own death. It is an adventure of discovery and disillusionment, during which the figure of death, as companion, mentor and guide, appears along the way in various guises. So this one, I seem to be going a bit deathy with a lot of my books at the moment, which isn't intentional, but this one looks absolutely fabulous, and I love the idea that if it's a sort of collection sort of predisposed to be talking about death, but it's this sort of bright blue, and it doesn't, you look at this and you don't necessarily think it's going to be a collection about death, but um, this one looks really exciting. So the next one is a poetry collection that I've been meaning to pick up for a while now, uh, Sean Borrodale's Bee Journal. Now this particular edition, gorgeous as it is, is part of the vintage collection where they've done A Sting in the Tail by Dave Coulson, H is for Hawk by Helen MacDonald, which is a fantastic book, The Running Sky by Tim D, and Crow Country by Mark Cocker. So they're all sort of books that are concerned with the natural world and nature in its various guises. And those are all illustrated by Timorous Beasties, a world-renowned studio famous for designs inspired by the natural world. And what a name, Timorous Beasties. That was appalling. I apologise to the whole of Scotland. I will not do that again. So Sean Borrodale is a writer who I discovered when I was at university. My lecturer recommended that I read his Notes for an Atlas, which I'm not entirely sure is available anymore, but it's this really thick, chunky collection. But it's not even really a collection, it's a stream of consciousness poem where he basically walked around the streets of London and just wrote down everything that he saw and heard and smelt and thought and felt, and it's just gorgeous. So I love his sort of continuing galloping writing, and I know this one's going to be very different. So B Journal is a poem journal of beekeeping that chronicles the life of the hive. It observes the living architecture of the comb... Comb. Comb, isn't it? B Journal is a poem journal of beekeeping that chronicles the life of the hive. It observes the living architecture of the comb, the range and locality of the colony, its flights, flowers, water sources, parasites, lives and deaths. Because of its genesis as a working journal, there is here an unusual intimacy and scrutiny of life and death in nature. 
The language is dense and clotted, the imagery thrillingly fresh, and the observing eye so close, scrupulous, and full of wonder. So I've been, as I say, I've been meaning to pick this one up for a while now, and I, we had a copy in work, and I thrust it into my friend's hand, who loves bees, and then I thought, oh, well, actually, I need a copy as well. So I ordered myself in one of these. So this one I'm going to get round to some point soon, maybe. So I've got myself a little bit confused now because some of the fiction ones that I bought I did buy before the ones that I hauled in my last haul video but because I split that up into a non-fiction haul some of these I bought before that one so I'm sensible. Then I picked up two slim-ish novels that for the life of me now I cannot remember where I'd heard of them. I think the first one I'd seen somebody post a picture of a snippet of it on on Twitter and it's the prose actually was was gorgeous and then when they said what book it was, I was like, oh, I've been eyeing that one up in work for a while and I've been a bit on the fence. So having read that little snippet, I was like, you know what, let's just go for it. And that one is All Days Are Night by Peter Stamm. Now, this is a granter book and it says Gillian seems to have it all. She is beautiful, successful and securely married. But one night after an argument with her husband, their car crashes on a wet road. When Gillian wakes in the hospital, she is a widow with a ruined face who must now revisit the past in order to make sense of her altered existence and begin to glimpse the freedom that might come with her loss. So this one, as I say, I've had my eye on it quite a few times in work. Every time I'm sort of shelving and, and I come to the S's and I see this one and another one by him, seven years, that's the other one I was thinking of. I can see those together on the shelf. And because I am quite a fickle magpie type person who is swayed by good covers this one struck me as did seven days so basically i thought sod it that glimpse that i saw on twitter or instagram actually whichever it was where somebody posted a bit of the text it read absolutely gorgeously so i thought i finally will give this one a go so all days and night by peter stam then another slim ish one which is a novel that i have always sort of meant to read and i keep getting asked if i've read it and i've never really been sort of that bothered about it and again i think at the moment i'm trying to sort of let go of some of these preconceptions of books that i have resisted reading for various reasons not all of them and there are some that I'm still not going to bother with. But just to, to get into some of these, and that is Jay McInerney's Bright Lights, Big City. You are at a nightclub, talking to a girl with a shaved head. The club is either Heartbreak or the Lizard Lounge. All might become clear if you could just slip into the bathroom and do a little more Bolivian marching powder. Then again, it might not. So begins our nameless hero's trawl through the brightly lit streets of Manhattan, sampling all this wonderland has to offer, yet suspecting that tomorrow's hangover may be caused by more than simple excess. It's a 1980s novel that is, is going to be absolutely fantastic and is really much talked about, but again, it's one that I've sort of resisted and I don't really know why. I think it's partly because his latest novel, Bright Precious Days, has a cover that doesn't sort of really appeal to me, so I kind of think I misconstrued what kind of author he was and what kind of writing he did, because this actually does sound right up my street and I'd always just sort of kept myself at a distance from it. So yeah, Bright Lights, Big City, going to give that one a try. I keep saying soon, who knows when it'll be. Then I picked up a small little Ray Bradbury book, Summer Morning, Summer Night. Now, I have not read any Ray Bradbury before, I realised. Not that I can recall, anyway. So this one is a collection of short stories and vignettes based in Greentown, Illinois. The fictionalised version of Ray ba Brad... The fictionalised version of Ray Bradbury's native Waukegan. No idea if I said that right. Which also served as the setting for his modern classics, Dandelion Wine, Something Wicked This Way Comes, and Farewell Summer. Among them are stories about a pair of elderly sisters who concoct a love potion with unexpected consequences. Hmm, that sounds... Hmm. The careful affection between a teacher and her young student. Hmm. The fireflies in the night who spark a conversation about life between a young boy and his grandfather. And this is a beautifully woven tapestry of stories that illuminates some of Greentown's hidden corners and reaffirms Bradbury's position as an undisputed master of fiction. So yeah, I've not read any Bray Brad... Bray Brad... Bray... Bray Bradbury before... I can't... Ray Bradbury. It's really hard to say. Have a more normal name. Not read any of his stuff before, so I'm going to give this little one a go. As I say, it's only a little thing. It's probably one that I'll just, you know. This is probably one that I will throw around a little bit. Don't mind this one getting bashed. So yeah, give that one a go. And then the same day I got the Ray Bradbury one, I got this one because it just looks insane. And it's called Jam by Yancy Croshaw. Now, I, again, it was one where I was shelving and I saw this one and I was like, hmm, that's an interesting cover. I mean, I really hate spiders, so... Mm -hmm. But I thought, yeah, we were prepared for an earthquake. We had had a flood plan in place. We could have even dealt with zombies, probably. But no one expected the end to be quite so sticky or strawberry-scented. Yancey Croshaw returns to print with a follow-up to his smash hit debut, Mogworld, a dark comedy about the one apocalypse no one predicted. I mean, from what I can gather, just I read the first page and... Um, had a little look at it. From what I can gather, I don't need to have read Mogworld, but um, if this one's as half as ridiculous as it sounds, then I probably will pick up Mogworld, so this one just looks really fun. And then the last fiction book that I picked up in May is Exquisite by Sarah Stovall. Now, this one is one that I've seen floating around in the shop, 
and was was intrigued by the cover. But then Alice Slater at Smoking Tofu on Twitter, who is a bookseller at Gower Street Waterstones and is just an all-round amazing person. And when it comes to books, you should definitely, definitely check her Twitter out because she's just incredibly intelligent and knows a lot about books. She has been raving about this one. So I was like, mm, okay, then I'm going to have to pick it up because I trust her judgment. Bo Luxton has it all. A loving family, a beautiful home in the Lake District and a clutch of best-selling books to her name. Enter Alice Dark, an aspiring writer who is drifting through life with a series of dead-end jobs and a freeloading boyfriend. When they meet at a writer's retreat, the chemistry is instant and a sinister relationship develops. Or does it? Breathlessly pacey, taut and terrifying, Exquisite is a startlingly original and unbalancing psychological thriller that will keep you guessing until the very last page. Now, I don't, as I've said, I don't read many sort of thrillers or crime books, what have you, so ones have to be quite strong, quite intriguing to, to get me get me on board and the idea of sort of writers at a writer's retreat getting sort of embroiled in some kind of crazy relationship appeals to me quite a lot and as I say Alice Slater's judgment on, on books just I know I've not been following on, on Twitter for that long um, but just yeah the books she likes I'm just like yes okay I'm gonna trust this and actually that last line on the blurb uh, keep you guessing until the very last page um, it was really interesting listening to Alice Slater and Bethany Rutter who runs a podcast called Hello Friend and on the latest episode Bethany had Alice on and they were talking about books and thrillers and one of the topics of conversation they got onto was this book and also thrillers with bad endings so it was quite interesting listening to that so I urge you to check that one out Hello Friend podcast I will link that one down below so I think I probably will start this one quite soon because I want to be able to talk to Alice about it while it's still fresh in her head so I'm gonna try and possibly read this one very soon but I seem to have said that about a lot of books so that is part three of my May wrap up the big graphic novel poetry fiction one um <sighs> I've already bought, as I've said, a few books in June at the moment. I think I'm going a bit mad because I've got a few days of holiday coming up as well and it's not like I've got enough books to read on five days of holiday anyway, so I had to get some more, obviously. But you know what, I think I'm going to stop apologising for like buying so many books. Like, I know I'm incredibly lucky to be able to do it and I know that. I'm fully aware of how lucky I am to be able to do it. And you know what, you can't take your money with you when you die and I'd rather die surrounded by a load of books than anything else. So deathy. And again, if you've read any of them, Keep them. Don't want to know if you didn't like them until I've read them. But if you did like them, tell me about them because that's fine. So I'm going to toddle off and edit this video and then get ready to go and work the Alan Lee event later on this evening at Waterstones Exeter. Now when I put this up, that will be in the past. Time travel. So yeah, Alan Lee's coming in store to talk about Baron and Luthien and the illustrations that he's done for that one. And we're going to have a special podcast episode for that. So when this video goes up, that podcast will probably also be up. So if it is, I'll put that in the link down below. And if you're a J.R.R. Tolkien fan and you're a fan of Baron and Luthien, you can have a little look at that one. Other than that, happy June. Have a good June. Oh, I'm really crap at this. Yeah, bye.